You know, it's not just about the protein. It's you know, the only place we get vitamin B12 in most of these situations is from animal source foods. That's the only place that they can get it. Um, some of the the essential uh, fatty acids and other things that only come in animal source foods are, you know, we're seeing more and more how important those are to development uh, of young children. Good afternoon uh, and welcome to the Dairy Podcast Show. Uh, it's a pleasure today to have uh, Dr. Jeff Dahl with us from the University of Florida. And we had some time uh, to catch up a little bit uh, before here, the recording, uh, for me to get to know a little bit about uh, what uh, Dr. Dahl does in his uh, day-to-day activities, a little bit of his background, and then uh, we'll chat a little bit more also about some interesting work he's doing uh, in the human side of nutrition and both um, uh, cognitive and and, and uh, physical development in in uh, young children. Uh, so, Jeff, welcome to the Dairy Podcast Show. Um, how are you today? I'm good. Thanks very much, Mark. Appreciate being on. Excellent. Uh, so, if you could just uh, give the listeners a little bit of of your background, uh, originally from uh, uh, the Northeast uh, Massachusetts, and, and and found your way across uh, a number of. Uh, uh, university uh, settings to down to Florida, where you've been, I think you said for 17 years. So, uh, uh, tell us how you kind of came came to uh, working working with dairy cattle. Yeah, well, uh, as you said, I'm originally from Massachusetts, kind of central Massachusetts. Grew up on a uh, small dairy. Uh, went to school at the University of Massachusetts, and then got interested in research. So, moved on to graduate school at Virginia Tech, and then PhD at Michigan State. Uh, and after some time at the University of Michigan, I uh, went to a uh, faculty position at the University of Maryland. And I was there for six years, um, research and uh, teaching position, and then moved to the University of Illinois, where I started a research extension position. Uh, most of my work uh, has been uh, around the idea of dry cow management. Um, a lot of it early on focused on um, photo period management and what we would do to uh, manipulate animals to improve production and health uh, with with lighting. Um, did some work with early lactation, frequent milking, and the subsequent sort of persistent effects on, on milk output. Uh, but at Florida, um, as you said, came here about 17 years ago, I worked uh, primarily with uh, dry cows uh, that we have uh, heat stressed or, or cooled and looked at the importance of getting those cows uh, cooled off during the dry period because of the impacts on the cow in that next lactation, but also more uh, recently, we've been focusing in on the negative impacts on the calf. Um, pretty brief uh, period of heat stress, uh, as I like to say, but it can have some pretty profound effects on those calves lifelong. Excellent. And I think that's a, a really timely topic, one in terms of uh, the time of year. We're, we're, we're in some cases uh, here in Torreón, Mexico, we're, we're already experiencing some heat stress, not quite what we will in, uh, in the middle of the summer, but obviously in many regions that's just, just starting to, uh, uh, to happen uh, you know, throughout the U.S. So um, you know, as, as I look back in my career, when I started, you know, the, the, the common, uh, scene or, or thought was that, you know, plenty of dry cows were quote out in the back 40, right. They were, they were fed maybe some round bale or on some, what we might call pasture and look at how we've evolved to, you know, nutritional strategies, um, and, and dry cow and close up. But I, I think, uh, you know, the area of cooling or, or improved cow comfort, uh, for the dry cow is, is still plenty of room, but but lots of herds who uh, now play, pay plenty of attention to those dry and close-up cows. So can you give us a little background of, uh, you know, how you got into the focus? Obviously, lo- lots of research and effort into uh, uh, lactating cow, and that's a pretty obvious one. I think, uh, you know, pretty much everywhere in the world, people provide some cooling method to their, their cattle, but... Uh, Still lots of opportunity in the dry cow. So can you lead us down that path a little bit? Sure. Uh, So I really got into it based on our photo period work. Uh, We were doing manipulations of lighting. Um, First study that we did, the idea was, well, we'll we'll get these animals on a a long day uh, photo period. That'll increase their prolactin output. Prolactin is really important around the time of calving to stimulate sort of full uh, differentiation of those secretory cells in the mammary gland. We thought, ah, we'll get more uh, secretory cells. The cows will make more milk in the next lactation. 
And um, turned out we got it exactly opposite, right? So it was it was better to have animals on a reduced photo period on a short day, darkness, uh, predominating because those animals actually then, as we moved into the next lactation, had better mammary development during the dry period and actually produced more milk in that next lactation. So it was exactly opposite. That has to do with the manipulation, not just of prolactin, but prolactin receptor. So there's always a lock. Uh, that goes along with the key that is the hormone. And when you sort of ramp one up, you a lot of times get a reduction in the other. And that's exactly what what we were seeing. So it was kind of a natural progression to, to work with heat stress uh, here uh, at Florida, obviously. Uh, similar sort of physiologic response uh, at play. Uh, but we thought that, well, you know, cooling cows should get those animals to have reduced uh, prolactin because heat stress actually increases it. Um, and that's kind of how we, we got into the whole thing. Um, see um, sort of similar effects on, on mammary development during the dry period if animals are on uh, a short day photo period or if they're on cooling. Uh, and that's, you know, consistent with the, the persistent increase in milk output in those animals, right? So it's not an effect on the, on the activity of the cells that are there. It's more of an effect on the capacity, the overall uh, mammary capacity for those animals to, to produce milk in that next lactation. Okay. Um, no, it's really interesting, the, the, the pathway there. And, and then w- you, uh, we mentioned a bit uh, when we discussed earlier the, the, the effect on the calf and what are, what are some of the, the things you're seeing on the, on the calf side, calf development, obviously the future production of that uh, replacement animal. Yeah, this was one that uh, it was just a well. Let's let's take a look. Let's let's see what's happening to those calves. We and we found you know some pretty interesting biology, but also some very interesting sort of economic I- impact on on those calves. Uh, the calves that are born to a heat stress dam are born at a lighter weight. That was not new information, right? That's been shown plenty of times uh, before that those calves that come from a heat stress dam, they're born a few days earlier. That explains some of it. Uh, But there's also uh, an impact of the heat stress on placental function. So those animals have reduced exchange of nutrients, gases, everything that goes to support that calf's really burst of of growth towards the end of, of gestation. So we're knocking that back. Um, and if it was just the growth effect, okay, we, we might be able to deal with that. Uh, but one of the really interesting things that we found was that the calves that were born to heat stress dams have lower capacity for immunoglobulin uptake from colostrum. And it wasn't really, you know, we've, we've kind of gone through this in a couple of different studies. Uh, it's very consistent. Uh, and it, it's there in the calf. It's not an effect on the colostrum itself. The cows that are heat stressed tend to produce a little less colostrum, but when you control for volume and everything else, those calves just have reduced capacity for immunoglobulin uptake. And so that appears to be um, an acceleration of their gut closure process, or maybe it's just, you know, already going on because they're heat stressed or it doesn't slow down. I'm not, I'm not sure which way you'd interpret it, but Um, Certainly it's there and those animals have lower capacity for IG uptake. You can't, you can't fix it after they're born. Uh, It's kind of like I say about dry cows, right? There's, there's too many things that you can screw up in the dry period that you can't fix in lactation. Well, you can screw up a lot in that calf in utero that you can't fix once it hits the ground. So regardless of what we do, once they hit the ground, we maybe have set them up for uh, lower productivity and lower health uh, early in, in life. And then we've now tracked animals all the way through three lactations if they were heat stressed in utero. And we see that there is a drag on milk yield. It's there from the first lactation. It's still there the second lactation all the way through the third lactation. Somewhere around three to four liters a day, less milk from those calves that were heat stressed in utero. And that's the only insult that they've seen uh, relative to the control animals, uh, but they make less milk throughout their time in the herd. The other thing is that those calves that are born to a heat stress dam leave the herd sooner. They've got about a year less life in the herd on average versus the animals that were from cooled dams. 
Okay. No, I guess I guess I continue continue to be um, you know uh, impressed by the the early uh, effects of of you know, colostrum management, you know, uh, uh, non dystocia birth and 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 heat stress and just you know the the long term productivity of that animal. Do you have any research to show what extent of an insult needs to occur? So, you know, do we need to cool these cows from the first day dry? What about late gestation, but pre-dry, um, close up, you know, is there, is there any way to recoup that? So if dry cows aren't cooled, but, but, but pre-fresh close up cows are cooled, is there some recuperation or is the damage done, so to speak? Yeah, that's a great question. It's one that we got a lot, you know, when we first started presenting the work, uh, because it was, now you want me to cool the dry cows too? I'm, I'm used to sort of uh, having them just go off on a vacation for 45 to 60 days, and I don't even think about them. As you said, they go off with a round bale in the back 40, and they're, they're done. Uh, so the only way, you know, there had been some work done with um, – some cooling of animals late in in the dry period, and they seem to have some response. It didn't seem to be as much as as we observed uh, with with our animals. Uh, so we designed a study to actually address that question, right? Um, and it was a pretty straightforward design. The animals were either heat stressed or cooled from the time they dried off, and then halfway through the dry period, and our dry period we're targeting kind of six to seven weeks dry. They're all multiparous animals. Um, so halfway through, we took half of the group, each group and shifted it to the other treatment. So now we've got four groups cooled the whole time, heat stressed the whole dry period, ones that were cooled the first half and then heat stressed second half of the dry period and ones that were heat stressed the first half and cooled the second half of the dry period. And, uh, lo and behold, it didn't come out again the way I predicted it would. Um, so that's why I don't. Uh, tend to bet on a whole lot of things, uh, but it was pretty interesting. Uh, essentially, the the cooling versus heat stress was just as we'd seen before. So the cooled animals made more milk than the heat stressed animals. The heat stressed animals early on, the heat stressed animals later on, no different from the animals that were heat stressed the entire time. So those animals, there's there's effects of heat stress early in the dry period. It looks like and effects late in the dry period and they, they can't be overcome. You can't replace one with the other, um, at least in our hands. And, and that was the production response. We didn't really have enough cabs to, to really say, you know, whether early or late. Um, my uh, sort of speculation would be um, that it doesn't matter how much heat stress we have, any amount of heat stress in those animals anytime during the dry period is going to be detrimental. And then you know, whether we would ever get enough animals to sort of tighter that out. Um, I can't, I can't say our interpretation is we need to cool animals for the entire dry period to realize the production responses in the cow. And I suspect to realize the benefit to that calf. Okay. What about the, the, uh, primiferous, uh, animal, the, the first lactation animal that's, you know, doesn't have a dry period, so to speak, but close up. Um, any data um, looking specifically at, at those uh, springing heifers? Yeah, yeah, we did. We did do a study looking at that specifically because that was another question that came up quite often uh, when we started presenting this. Now I got to cool, cool my heifers too, right? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And that's right. That's right. Uh, and I just had a conversation with a, a group of uh, nutritional consultants the other day, and you know, they they were saying the same things. You know, when when do we start cooling these animals? I think the diminishing returns comes into it there, but. What we saw was that we brought the heifers in, and in this case, we did it for the 60 days because eight weeks kind of worked out in our system. We brought them in off a of pasture in summer in Florida, uh, brought them into our freestall barn and exposed them to either only shade, which is our heat stress control all the time, or the cooled animals had access to the soakers and, and the fans that the mature cows would have. And um, the heifers that were cooled made more milk than the heifers that were not cooled for that 60-day period. And it was on the order of three liters a day uh, in that first lactation. So pretty strong indication that this is, a, you know, just a, a, a typical biological response, whether it's her first lactation or her fifth lactation. She's going to respond the same way to that late gestation effect. 
Um, and, you know, we, we're now looking at impacts on placental function uh, as sort of the nexus where the effects on the cow and the effects on the calf come together because of the importance, obviously, of the placenta, not only to support that developing fetus, but also produces a lot of hormones that are going to be involved in memory development, other things that influence the cow. And uh, obviously that animal coming into her first lactation has a placenta and is going to be affected the same way by heat stress as the mature cow. So kind of makes sense. So um, I'm jotting down some questions here because I'm, I'm thinking of lots of things and this is a, gr this is a great discussion. Um, when do you start? So, you know, we, we, before we connected, we talked a little bit about um, some syndrome we're seeing, if we, we want to call it that, in, in newborn calves of, of signs of heat stress. We know that in, in hot climates, we see calves that are, you know, in hutches and, and uh, exhibit signs of heat stress, you know, uh, panting or you know, high respiration rates, what have you, maybe some increase of uh, uh, morbidity. Yeah, well, you know, how, how far back when we, you know, are we are, at some day, are we to the point where we're cooling animals from birth? And, and, you know, are there some effects? So 60 days, that's something we can work with management wise. We can cool those animals. You know, three liters is, is significant. You know, what about the 60 days before? Or what about that newborn calf? I, you know, a, a, any, any data or any uh, information that would suggest um, those long-term effects uh, at an early age? Yeah, well, um, in terms of the early age, let, let's take that one first. Uh, there's certainly information out there that shows that calves that are heat stressed, their gains won't be as good, um, you know, that, that we can get some returns on, on growth effects. Um, I would have to look back. I don't know that any of those studies had enough animals to really truly look at uh, morbidity, mortality in a, in a sort of structured way. Uh, but certainly they do do better from a growth standpoint if they are at least shaded, right, early in life versus uh, what we might see in some areas where calves just have calf hutches. Uh, so there, there's definitely going to be a, a positive response there. Um, one of the things that, that we tried was, you know, can we reverse some of these in utero effects by cooling animals early in life? And the quick answer is no, we can't. They did better with the cooling than the animals that continued to be heat stressed, but you can't reverse these sort of programming effects that the plasticity that you know, the in utero calf experiences are much different than, than when they hit the ground. Um, so we can't, can't reverse those effects. Um, in terms of the, the older animals, um, there are, I think, two analyses out there that have looked at the, the potential for heat stress at the time of fertilization uh, or breeding uh, to impact those animals long term. So the calves from those animals. Um, and it was all done with, with heifers, uh, because most of the cows would have been cooled probably, uh, during lactation. Um, and they found that there are some effects in those calves of heat stress very early on. Um, I'm not sure that that's something that, uh, I'm going to sort of recommend that people try and manage because it's just pretty difficult to do at that time. And I also think that, you know, when we looked at it at the last 60 days of gestation, you know, that's when that calf is accumulating lots of body mass, right? That, that placenta is, is really working at that time. And so I think, again, it's going to be one of these uh, issues of diminishing returns. The earlier we go, yes, would we have some effect? Perhaps uh, would we be able to detect it? I'm not sure. We need a large number of animals. Um, so from a practical standpoint, I think as much as we can do to get those dry cows cooled the entire dry period and get our heifers cooled for, you know, a couple of months before they come in. That's really the, the first step to, to making this pay off down the road. Okay. No, that, that, uh, that's some really good, uh, practical information. Um, let me ask Jeff, um, you know, in, in, in some regions that we work, we'll sometimes get a little bit of pushback that, uh, you know, we don't have heat stress. Um, I think most producers, uh, industry folks are, 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 uh, pretty well uh, aware of temperature, humidity index, and so forth, and when we hit stressors. But, um, you know, I, I sometimes chuckle when I see a heat stress trial that's maybe done in, in New York or even Canada, and I, I have to maybe argue with some of our clients in Mexico, you know, if, if there's heat stress trials conducted in Canada, then 
yes, there's there's heat stress in June, July, and August, and in, in, in all of Mexico. But it, but again, where and obviously de- um, in different geographic areas, we have temperature, humidity. Right, Florida is going to be very different than Torreon. Um, you know, s- similar stress, but very different temperatures and humidity. So, you know, basically, we are. W- at what point do you start cooling? The, the dry cows or the or the close-up heifers from a from a take-home message standpoint to, to the listeners, right? Because some folks still don't believe that there's heat stress when we, you know, perhaps know well that there really is. Yeah. Well, I always like to point out that uh, when people tell me it's only, you know, two, maybe three, four weeks of, of hot weather that we get here in the summer in the Northeast or in the Midwest, I point out that, uh, you know, remember you're going from the air conditioned house to the air conditioned truck to the air conditioned office at the barn. That cow is out there without fans, without soakers. And she's also got that big fermentation vat that's uh, producing a lot of heat that she also has to get rid of. So not quite uh, appropriate to compare what you feel to with what she feels. We know she gets hot before we do and it gets uncomfortable. Um, So I guess what I tell people is that, you know, you you need to look at some very um, easy ways to assess heat stress. And even more so than than rectal temperature, can you just go out and look at at panting behavior? Can you look at respiration rate? Because when we've, we've taken data from our studies and sort of compared rectal temperature with respiration rate, we see that once the dry cows get over 60 in respiration rate, she's heat stressed. As that increases, so as she goes to 65, to 70, to 75, she's more and more heat stressed. So I would challenge folks to go out and actually make some measurements in their dry cow pens of respiration rate. And is there any indication that those cows are, are actually heat stressed. Uh, but, you know, in terms of the, the temperature and the humidity, um, for a lot of the cows in the U.S., when we think about, when I think about having grown up in the Northeast, having spent a lot of time in the Midwest, you know, when they get hot, they get humid. Is it as bad as it here, is here in Florida? No. But it's still hot, humid weather. And even if it cools off some at night, it's still high humidity in the morning. That's just typical sort of change that we see and, and inversion that we see between humidity and temperature. So there's a lot more potential for, for heat stress than people realize. We actually did a, a economic analysis on this when we first started making these presentations. And our estimate was, you know, a, a heat stress day is one where the average THI is over 68. And we did those estimates for all the top dairy producing states in the country. And you'd be surprised, uh, you know, Florida came out as the worst or the best, however you want to say it, uh, in terms of number of heat stress days. But, you know, there's plenty of Pennsylvania, New York, Indiana, uh, Ohio. I mean, they all have significant potential periods of heat stress when we use that as, as our indicator. And the average for the top 23 states in the U.S. was about 90 days of heat stress. So that means for, you know, a quarter of the year, our cows are potentially heat stressed and the cows that are dry at that time, if we don't do anything, are potentially at risk of, of having some of these, these impacts. Uh, but the other thing is we assume the same number of cows calved every month. Well, we know that's not true. When do most cows calve? We get more cows calving in the fall. So a higher percentage of our herd is typically going to be potentially exposed to heat stress. So there's there's much more impact, I think. I think we were pretty conservative with our estimates uh, on that. And it all came out as a benefit to getting those cows cooled off. And, and, and it's great to hear, Jeff, that, you know, not only the biology of this, but the economics, right? And because again, we got to justify the investments in in sprinklers and fans and, and whatever methods um, are being used for, for cooling. And I guess that leads me down then the path I know, you know, you and your group are doing some um, innovative work in terms of um, how we cool cows. And obviously in certain uh, regions, uh, you know, conservation of water is obviously very important in, in arid climate. So, um, you know, what are, what are some of the uh, systems you're evaluating and, wh- and what will be coming down the pike, so to speak, in terms of uh, novel 
uh, opportunities to cool cows. Yeah, we uh, uh, did a study with uh, some of these smart soakers uh, last year where we compared uh, sort of the the soakers that only come on when an animal is in front of them and they soak the animal and it turns off and then she can come back a few minutes later. They don't, they don't sort of stay on if she's there for an hour uh, and compared those to our traditional system that comes on every five minutes, kind of soakers on for a minute, whether there's a cow in front of her, in front of that soaker or not, right? They're, they're sort of the, the dumb soakers would like to call, uh, and then our heat stress treatment. And to me, uh, you know, that we didn't see a difference between the rectal temperature or respiration rate between the two cooling groups. So those smart soakers work just as well to get the cows cooled off effectively as the traditional soaking system. And obviously the cows in the heat stress group were the, the controls that they had higher rectal temperature and respiration rate. Dry matter intake, not different between the two group, cooled groups, but the other ones, the heat stressed animals had lower dry matter intake in the dry period. To me, the most important piece of data was the water. We measured the water that the cows consumed, right, in each treatment. So how much they were drinking and added that to the amount of water that was going through the soaker system. And we got an estimate sort of for each group on the total water utilization for cooling and drinking for each of those treatments. The soaker, the traditional soaker system was about three times the amount uh, as the smart soaker system total. So what they consumed and what went through the system there wasn't really a difference between the heat stress cows and the smart soakers. So they were consuming a lot more water to try and cool off if they were heat stressed versus the animals that were getting water put on their backs and it was cooling them off much more effectively. So from a total water utilization standpoint, one study, fairly small numbers, but that would suggest that we can actually do a better job with a limited amount of water by getting it on their backs to get them cooled off rather than having them consume that water. And that has implications for sort of the, the, the pushback that I'd get. Well, my manure handling system can only handle a certain amount of water. Well, guess what? You're already, you're stressed, already, there. You're you're already there. there. Yeah, exactly. you're already there. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly. some really interesting data. Yeah. A any, any other type if you would, not novel systems, uh, you know, we've seen those in, uh, you know, starting to, to uh, be implemented on some dairies, but is there, you know, really anything out of the box coming or are we, we still have lots of opportunity to develop uh, newer systems? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, as we look at some of these AI sort of approaches, particularly with uh, camera imaging and that type of thing, we're going to be able to really even get down to to the finer points of who's hot and who's not and what we might do to improve an animal's cooling uh, on, a, on an animal per animal basis, even with a larger pen of animals. But, you know, that's that's down the road, I think, uh, not there yet. But we can do a lot even with our systems now uh, to to limit the amount of water we're wasting, uh, because, you know, one of the things that drove us to do that study was we looked at just very simple measurement. How many cows are in front of the soakers at any one time? And we did it for, you know, on an hourly basis for 24 hours. We were wasting about two thirds of the water or more, right? Going through that system. So, and it's not, I don't, I don't want to say don't cool your cows, but eventually, and in some areas it's even more important, but we're all going to have limitations on the amount of water that we put through those systems. Yeah. And that really makes perfect sense. I mean, you know, how many times we are arrived to a facility and it's, it's, uh, you know, sometime after milking and all the cows are down resting as we want them to be. And this, the soakers are running and then just, you know, dumping water into the, uh, the feed alley. So, um, um, going back to, um, the dry cow and the calf and, and, um, I, I probably have to ask this question because it just comes up so often and I, and I don't think really anyone has the answer, but colostrum volume, you know, your, your work in photo period and heat stress, you know, it's something that we see around the world in, in different temperatures, you know, different, uh, uh, climates, different geographic areas, you know, the, the, you know, our, our opinion is it's photo period, but can you, can you comment at all? 
because it's a common complaint we get. Okay, we you know we do we don't have enough colostrum, or we're we're battling colostrum quantity, not necessarily quality in all cases, but quantity. Well, and there seems to be a genetic component to it too, right? You hear about it, at least I have heard about it a little more with jerseys, perhaps than than with with Holsteins with other breeds. Um, I'm actually reading a dissertation right now where they tried to look at some of that. Um, yeah, I, I think part of the issue is that it's multifaceted. It's not just the photo period. It's the photo period layered on top of the heat stress that that animal might have, have experienced. Because you know, typically when I start to hear about this is in the fall. And so it, it's going to be at a time when we have had animals that were very hot on the longest sort of photo period that they might have been exposed to. And then as we come into the fall, as I said before, those animals that were hot that were on long photo period are going to have higher circulating prolactin. Prolactin is critically important to immunoglobulin uptake for colostrum uh, production. So I think that as we move then into the fall, if those animals aren't on a shorter photo period, they sort of go into the barn and they're on a longer extended light, they've had no opportunity to sort of have that change uh, occur. And if we have hotter temperatures, then same thing. If we haven't cooled those animals off effectively, we may have less of a chance for that recovery to occur. So um, I, I, my best answer at this point is it's probably a combination of the lighting and the the temperature that those animals experience. And if we can get that reduced for a time before they come in to lactation, it's probably going to be a, a, an advantage to them from a from a colostrum standpoint. And you now, of course, colostrum is starting to accumulate much earlier in the dry period than we typically think of, right? It's not just about those last couple of days before she calves in. She's been pulling in immunoglobulin into that uh, alveolus for a long time. And so we want to do it with with timing in mind so that we can actually overcome some of these effects. And I, I think that that's probably what it's going to take eventually is kind of divvying up the, those those things and and doing some some unique studies that kind of combine effects of temperature with with lighting. Excellent. No, that that sounds like a really uh, a physiologically based uh, uh, explanation that that makes sense. It was the same. We see it in the fall, and and Jersey's more affected than than other breeds, and and uh, so uh, it sounds like. Perhaps with some manipulation, we, we could go some uh, to some length to sur- solve some of that, perhaps. Cooling and, and, and maybe some uh, manipulation of, uh, of day length. Um, so I'm really interested to hear more about um, some of the human uh, stuff you're doing. But before we move in that direction, just from the, from the heat stress standpoint, you know, what the, the take home point for the, 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 the listeners here is, um, we'd say cool, cool your dry and, 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 and close up cows, heifers. Um, but, but, you know, it, really that's the, that's the take home point, right? There's a lot, there's, there's value in, in to the cow and to that calf, the future productivity of that calf to um, not only the comfort, the comfort standpoint, but, you know, truly, truly an economic advantage. Absolutely. I, I think that, um, you know, the first thing I'd say is, if you're milking cows, you have heat stress, right? It was always the, the old thing. If you're milking cows, you probably have some level of mastitis, no matter how well you manage it. If you're milking cows, you have heat stress. The dry cows are going to experience heat stress to uh, a great extent in most of our, our situations now because we're not effectively managing it, but can have a significant impact on that cow's not only productivity, but her health. And I would also submit that it's probably one of those things that's going to be questioned from a consumer standpoint, right? How are those late pregnant animals treated? Um, so that's that, you know, the, the public perception angle is another reason why we want to do it. Not just the economic reason, but there are multiple reasons why we want to consider doing this and getting those animals uh, cooled off effectively. When we did our estimates based on productivity in the cow uh, and then followed that up with another estimate based on all the work that we did with the calves. It was about a billion and a half dollars a year potential loss to the U.S. dairy industry if we don't cool our dry cows. So that was across the country um, looking at 
getting cows effectively cooled in the dry period versus those animals that that would not be effectively cooled. So about a billion and a half dollars a year, similar to some of the estimates that we see for uh, you know, not uh, having animals uh, cooled during lactation, um, similar to you know, the impacts of mastitis. Um, so it, it's not insignificant. And the other thing is that those calves that are heat stressed in utero don't recover. And she may pass that on to her offspring as well, or at least some element of it. So this is a, a fetal programming issue that we need to sort of uh, consider long term. So really, we need to think multi generational. Really, you know what? Yeah, what? Absolutely. So a herd, you know, in, in a especially in a in a heat stress climate, um, you know, such as Florida, Torreon, and plenty of other regions, you, you may actually have a herd that that needs to recover over generations from from prolonged heat stress in, within the herd, correct? Right. Well, and I guess I would look at it as, uh, you know, what it is, is we are limiting their ability to express their full genetic potential. It doesn't mean that eventually those cows would be producing no milk. It just means that they're not able to express their full genetic potential. And so that sort of increase that we're seeing with genetic improvement isn't going to go away. It's just that they don't ever get up to that sort of upper end of the spectrum. They're always going to be at that lower end uh, if, if we don't think about managing this during the dry period. So Jeff, you, you quote that number in terms of the industry, and that's huge. Do you have a return on investment? You know, in most cases, we tend to think of cooling systems in general as, you know, low to moderate investments. It's not a huge investment. So uh, any idea on what that return might be to say, okay, you know, if, if you install this system and you can cool your dry close-up cows, you're looking at this return. Yeah, I don't have the exact number on a per cow basis, of course, because that's going to vary by how much time we'd actually have animals potentially heat stressed. But what I can tell you is we did, uh, you know, a net present value assessment in our first run looking at this economically. And uh, we used a number of milk prices. We used a number of potential production responses from a liter a day to five liters a day, which is kind of the, the conservative range that we look at. Um, and a number of, of different costs on a per stall basis to put up a new facility. And, you know, using that average uh, across the states here, uh, the milk producing states of 90 days of heat stress, almost every one of those combinations turned out to be profitable. So as we get more and more heat stress, right, if we have 120 days, it, it just makes even more sense. Um, but yeah, we have not figured on a, on a per cow basis what, what those returns would be just because it's going to vary based on how much heat stress we experience or how long I would say it's more an accurate way of putting it, right? It's not so much the intensity of the heat stress, because I think that's probably similar across the areas. It's just that we have nine to 10 to 11 months of it here in Florida, whereas somewhere in the Northeast might only have three or four months of it. Okay. But, it, but even if you have those three months, you're, 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 you're going to have a return or at, at, the, at the least a break even, we would imagine, but a return on that, yeah. I, you're going to have a return on the milk from the cow and you're going to have, uh, I would say, a significant return uh, on the calf. Excellent. You know, uh, if, if I was asked, you know, when I wanted to, to buy a group of, of heifers, if they were genetically identical and uh, came from the same herd, if I had a group of heifers to buy, would I buy the ones that were born in September and October or would I buy the ones that were born in March and April? I'd buy the ones that were born in March and April. Oh, yeah, easy, easy answer, easy answer. That that's great, and 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 real practical um, recommendations for for our listeners here. Um, so Jeff, uh, tell us a little bit about um, you know we're obviously all uh, the folks listening to this podcast proponents of consumption of, of dairy products, right? And and uh, you know we know there's places in the world where uh, people don't have access to uh, sufficient amounts of, of, of protein. And, and in many cases, animal protein can be a very, uh, uh in some cases inexpensive or, or uh, more available, uh, especially with some, uh, more widespread, uh, technologies and, and adaptation, helping developing countries and the growth of their agriculture. So what are some of the things you're doing, um, with your group there in that area? 
Yeah, well, we have a, a large program here. It's funded by um, the State Department, the USA, uh, U.S. Agency for International Development, um, looking specifically at helping some of the, the countries around the world that have the, the worst levels, the, the highest levels of physical stunting, which we now know is also associated, associated with cognitive stunting. And we're trying to look at improving access to animal source foods uh, to particularly vulnerable groups, which includes pregnant, lactating women and kids under two, because that's when we can really see these in utero effects of improved nutrition for the mom in terms of development of the, the babies. And then as they kind of go through those first two years, there's tremendous opportunity to improve their and reduce the levels of both physical stunting and then cognitive stunting as well, so that these kids are not set up for a life of, of lesser sort of uh, development. Um, we are, it's interesting to me that in a lot of these countries we work in, dairy is one of the areas that they really see as an opportunity because they've got uh, potential for feed resources. They may not have you know, the potential to have as high a level of productivity as we would expect to be normal, but they can get uh, good output of milk if managed properly. Uh, but they lack the, um, a lot of times the, the understanding of the basics of dairy management, right? Things like cows need to have feed in front of them all the time. Cows need to have water in front of them all the time. There are differences between you know, sort of some of the, the, the grasses and other forages that are available in these countries that need to be supplemented with certain byproducts that can be supplemented with those rather than feeding one at a time. You know, we feed this for five months and then we have to go to byproduct feed during the, the dry season. Well, if we put up some forage, we can actually make a, a, a mix of that that is more nutritionally sound for, for those, those uh, cattle and they'll have improved productivity. Um, it, it's, it's really um, not, uh, I, I would say from a technical standpoint, anything that would surprise you, but it's getting folks to understand why we're implementing some of these things to improve their productivity. And eventually it's all about getting improved access to, to those animal source foods uh, for the the moms and and those uh, those kids early in life, um, you know, it's not just about the protein. It's you know, the only place we get vitamin B twelve in most of these situations is from animal source foods. That's the only place that they can get it. Um, some of the the essential uh, fatty acids and other things that only come in animal source foods are you know, we're seeing more and more how important those are to development uh, of young children. So um, animal source foods make a lot of sense, but we need to increase the capacity for, for productivity at a price that, that is affordable. So that sounds like a super uh, rewarding project. I mean, um, those of us who are all in the dairy industry and, and passionate about dairy, you know, we, we see um, helping improve productivity, efficiency, efficiency for the, for the farm, for the, you know, those cattle, but, you know, in most developed areas where we're, we're not directly in, uh, in impacting the human nutrition side or development of, 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 of children. Right. So I, um, I, that, that sounds like a, a, an amazing project and really goes hand in hand with what we, you know, we, we do, uh, you know, this, this discussion here where we're, we're feeding the late lactation cow better, the, you know, the, the whole nutrition of the young calf and, and, Look at over the years how how we have improved uh, milk feeding uh, recommendations of of the young calf and so forth. So so really, it's it's just uh, you know extrapolating those very basic concepts of good nutrition and management to to uh, humans who unfortunately maybe don't have those opportunities. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, it is rewarding. I enjoy it. Um, I kind of got. I, I like to say sort of two paths. Um, some very sort of what I think is more intensive technical work that we do, uh, but then also the the uh, the more developmental work. Um, so it's an, an enjoyable uh, position to be in. Yeah, it also remind reminds us, you know, uh, a whole different topic, and, and and maybe another podcast about you know choices of of consuming animal protein or not. But I I recall well during a a visit in a rural area of of, of Thailand a number of years ago where there were some um, protesters. Um, you know, trying to convince uh, folks in this uh, community to not consume animal protein. And I, I engaged with them in a very professional way and just, you know, look, look at the group you're talking to. 
where are these people going to get protein? You know, they're in a region where they're not, they don't have to go to the, they can't go to the supermarket and buy this uh, extensive selection of, of, uh, other produce and, and, uh, products that can help supplement their needs. And so, uh, again, outside of this podcast now, but, but just, you know, keep, keep in mind what's available to, uh, to people to, to select from in a, in a country, right? Dairy, dairy, you know, if eggs, poultry, what have you are, are in general, fairly easy to come by. You know? And absolutely. I mean, increasing the diversity of the diet for people can have tremendous impacts, again, on sort of development, particularly in, in children. And that's that's really one of the things that we're talking about. By making animal source foods more accessible, we are increasing the dietary diversity, which kind of goes back again to the basics, right? Eat a balanced diet, <laughs> multiple groups. We don't you know, just focus on, on one thing. That's probably not going to be beneficial overall. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Jeff, it's been a, a real pleasure to, to get to know you further and, and, and learn more about your, uh, your current research. Um, you know, certainly, uh, any search of your, your name or your group and, 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 uh, dairy science brings up a, a plethora of, of articles on, uh, on photo period and, and heat stress and, and, and so forth. So really great to, uh, learn more and, and get some of those take home points for our listeners here. So thanks for that opportunity. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, and if you've got any, you know, if folks have any more questions, have them feel free to contact me. And, uh, hopefully we can, we can uh, provide some additional information for them. That's great. Great. So, uh, Jeff Dahl, uh, university of Florida. Um, so, uh, I know you can, uh, Google the, the university website and, and certainly get Jeff's contact. It's time for our famous three. When it comes to raising healthy animals, you need more than the right solutions. You need the right partner who brings decades of industry expertise and a global team to put that knowledge to work for the advancement of your operation. At Fibro Animal Health Corporation, we are proud to work with you as your trusted partner. Typical fresh cow incidence of clinical hypocalcemia is three to 6% while subclinical hypocalcemia affects 50% or more mature cows. Based on cutting edge research, Exelete offers a new approach that is build effective and the ZDUs. For more information, visit www.protecta.com. As we wrap up here, Jeff, uh, a few of these uh, questions that we've been wrapping up the podcast with, uh, you know, w what are one of the resources uh, could be anything from, from lay press to an old textbook. I see you got quite a, uh, selection behind you <laughs> there of, of yeah. uh, the antique uh, collection. Yeah. yeah at yes, this point, <laughs> yes. uh, the people are collecting far fewer, you know, in print things and everything's electronic now, but, uh, but you know, if you had to turn around there, what, what would be that one go-to that you would pull off the, the shelf? Um, well, I would probably not pull any of those off the shelf, although I think that, again, coming back to the basics, it's there in some of those textbooks that are even 50 years old at this point. Uh, but you know, one of the things that has been, I think, such a huge dramatic change is that uh, the, the Journal of Dairy Science, other uh, sort of academic journals where we can glean some information out of them are now available for free online. People can go in and just search those and, and look for information that that might have um, a bearing on, on how they, they manage their animals and, and ask the folks like yourself, um, other nutritional consultants, other people who are consulting with them, you know, how do I interpret this? Is this something that, that, that I want to, to try uh, here on my farm? So I think that's one of the things that to me over the last really five years has become so um, important to the access to knowledge that's that's out there. And it's, it's all, you know, it's not a subscription based thing anymore. You can just get it for free. Um, so uh, that's that's what I would suggest. Excellent. And then, um, you know, when you're not connected to, uh, to dairy research and, and, and working with your team, uh, what what's maybe something you could suggest for folks to uh you know podcast the book what have you documentary that uh expand their horizons yeah yeah i uh well i tend to like a lot of i i read i try and read sort of outside of of what we do so i don't know if that means that i read too much and i i just can't get away from it uh but uh, i i've really enjoyed didn't think i would uh, i got a kindle and now i can just 
download all kinds of books on there and it varies. I do a lot of history uh, reading and, um, you know, sort of biographies and, and just stories about historical incidents uh, that, that may have happened. Um, and uh, I find it really fascinating to go back in history because, you know, things keep repeating themselves. Uh, and I think that some of our work uh, bears that out, right? The things that we know uh, that we should have known, uh, you know, sure enough, that that uh, bears itself out. Exactly. And that's a great point. I, I look back, you know, in, in my career, veterinary and, and nutrition, you know, how many things we we used to do and then don't do, or they have come back in vogue or out of vogue. And, and, and so whether it be, you know, history, history or, or history of what, what we do in our, our professional careers, it, it, it does kind of replay itself at times. And then as we, we part here, I guess, outside of um, cool your dry cows is probably the Jeff Dahl uh, <laughs> motto, but what, what would be, uh, you know, a, a word to the wise, if you will, or a comment on, you know, what, what you see separates the, the successful dairy producer, um, you know, from, from maybe those, those herds that, that struggle a little bit more? Yeah, well, I think it's it's not just a successful dairy producer. I think about it in students and and others at times. You know, persistence beats potential um, every time. Uh, so working at it and having a game plan to how we're going to actually just keep with this, uh, I think is is really important. Um, uh, so getting good information and executing a plan to get that information translated into how we manage those animals is going to be uh, the the best thing, and that's. That's what I see. Um, the number of farms that that do really well that you, know, you just the consistent sort of comment you hear about them is they do all the little things right, and they just always do the little things right. I think is is really important. Uh, back to the basics, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great. Well, those are some great uh, great words of wisdom. Um, again, Jeff, uh, been a real great opportunity here. Look forward to visiting with you some more as we as we talk about about heat stress also, and and uh, working with our our client uh, and our client groups. Um, but you have a great uh, day. Stay cool as, as as heat stress has started in 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 Florida, and and we'll look forward to a further further conversation. All right. Thanks a lot, Mark. Appreciate it. Take, take care. <laughs>